If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Greetings and welcome again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, and I want to thank you for being with us today. Well, we're doing a special show today, and I have a very special guest with me. We're doing a show on Islam, and it's a show, not just a theological analysis of Islam, but it's a show from personal experience, as you might uh, uh, wonder about. It's, it's, it's from uh, living a life in an Islamic country, and then relating that to uh, our Western culture, which really has no concept of this. So this makes this pro program different than most of the kinds of shows that we do. Usually you just see us analyzing different theological positions, but when we can have a special guest like this on our program that has been there, lived it, understands what it means to live in an Islamic culture in an Islamic country, well, that can speak volumes, the experience of that, rather than just looking at some books and giving personal uh, ideas about theological positions. So uh, with me today, joining me as my special guest, is Reverend Salim Masi. And thank you for being with us. Thank Reverend. you for inviting me. Really appreciate me. it. Uh, he's a native of Pakistan. He's born in a small town there where he personally experienced persecution from the Muslim population. He was born and raised in Pakistan and lived there for 33 years, worked as an ordained minister of the Christian gospel in Pakistan, and then relocated to the United States where he continues his Christian ministry in the Lord's service. Salim Masi was never a Muslim, but he was raised in the Christian faith and saw Islamic culture from this very personal perspective. Now, if... Our viewers didn't get a chance to see show one in this two-part series. They really missed something because my guest, uh, Salim, really got into some personal experiences of his life and those of his relatives living in Pakistan. And uh, Salim, we don't have time to go through all that again and praise the Lord by modern technology. It's all recorded on tape. Okay. And those that missed it can get contact our ministry or other ministries that may pick up on this video and uh, see it uh, later there. But I would like for our viewers right now who are tuning in and seeing this for the first time, uh, could you give just uh, a couple of examples without going into all of the different examples, but of uh, some of the persecution you personally experienced or your family experienced as you were growing up or even after that in Pakistan as a result of the Islamic religion in the, mo the, the Muslim population there? <clears throat> I just want to repeat myself for, for the audiences who, who have already seen this uh, first part of our video. I'll give them some more examples how we, or personally I and my family, have experienced persecution as Christians. I remember my brother did some high school education and he wanted to join uh, a, a clerical job in Pakistan and he was refused because they said, oh no, Christian cannot be equal to us. It has, this position has to go to a, a Muslim. And my brother was refused that job and he had to struggle till he got another job. And uh, we brought this out in the last program, but basically by this you're saying that Christians and minority religions outside of Islam and the Muslim faith are considered in Pakistan as second-class citizens. Yes, and lower, lower class. Okay, so he, here's an example of 
he's refused a job because simply because not that he's not qualified and he and not that he can't do the job it's just that because he's the second class christian who uh, according to the islamic culture is considered I think you said from the last program, dirty mm-hmm. or a kafir, an unbeliever, yes. and someone who's worthy cursed. of shame and yes. cursed and, yeah. and all these things. Uh, well, could you just give us another couple of brief examples? Uh, okay, so here's a thing. You gave us an example of someone turned down for a job. Does it get any worse than that? Mm-hmm. Is there any other worse uh, persecution than just being turned down for a job? I remember once <clears throat> I wanted to, I was a young boy, and I wanted to eat uh, in, a, in a restaurant. And uh, because I saw everybody's eating, and I felt like I was a human just like them, and I'm equal, equal, equally human like them, and uh, and I wanted to eat in the restaurant, and I went to eat a restaurant, and they came to know that I was a Christian, and they beat me up, and they threw all the vessels that I used outside of the hotel, so because it became unclean, and I was crying and crying and crying, and I went home and told my my parents that this is what happened to me. And, and they could not do anything. And they were crying with me. And so uh, is this prevalent, or is this something that was just uh, something you personally and your family experienced, or is this throughout the country? This is throughout the country. This is throughout the country. Uh, things have changed a little bit, but there's only in the big cities. If people don't know you, it's okay. If people come to know you, that you're a Christian, and, and they will not eat with you they will not in eat the eat restaurants. With you. And uh, is there any more serious persecution, like uh, threats of uh, violence, of death, or something of that nature that goes on there? Yes. As I mentioned in my previous uh, video, that there's so many Christian young and men and women who, who try to witness Christ, and uh, they have been beaten, they have been stabbed, and they have been threatened by letters, so that they will not continue to witness Christ. So there, there's a threat of death. Death, all the time. Yeah. All the time. And I know by you... the law, by the Sharia law, which I mentioned in my earlier uh, talk with, uh, with uh, Larry, that uh, Sharia law uh, code 295C, that anything you say against Muhammad or Islam or Quran is a, a, a crime against blasphemy against Muhammad or, or Islam or Quran, and you can be put to death for that. Yeah, it's a, it's a and crime. that's and that's a crime uh, if you commit or any non-Muslim or even Muslim commits can be punished with death. And I, I remember when you read it from the, the last show, it only takes four Muslims to testify against you. Yes, and you could be put to death. Put to death for uh, that crime. Right, exactly. And so uh, Christians in Pakistan are persecuted. They're treated as second-class citizens. Uh, They can be uh, uh, brutalized by uh, violent attacks or even killed. Uh, We won't go into it here, but you mentioned how some of your relatives were killed Mm -hmm. because of their Christian faith. And uh, people out there, you're watching this, you ought to you, you really need to see that first video. It'll, it'll, it'll just tear at your heart. But anyway, we don't want to uh, reiterate everything from the first show because we want to obviously give new material and something different uh, in the second broadcast. But anyway, that's just to lay the groundwork that in Pakistan, according to the Islamic rules, regulations, and religion, uh, that we have this atmosphere here or there that uh, lends itself to persecution of Christians and putting them down and uh, basically lording itself over anyone and treating them almost like less than human beings. Yes. Uh, and it's all because of the Islamic religion. Yes. Which we're told in this culture is a religion of peace. No, but it's a, not. Uh, in fact, could you explain that for a second to our viewers who've been hearing nothing but reli- Islam is a religion of peace uh, Well, constantly? Constantly we hear that. <laughs> uh, we hear that, and I will, I'll, I'll compare uh, Christianity and Islam, and I'm going to read from an from a, uh, article written by Dr. Salim Al-Mahdi. He's one of the uh, one very well-read uh, scholar, and he writes a lot, and he writes for the Voice of the Martyrs, and I'm going to read from one of his, his, his uh, research that he has done. He says, some Muslims behave violently and act in ways that do not make sense. 
Muslims fight with each other, persecute Christian minorities in their countries, and kill even their Muslim brothers in Islamic countries such as Egypt, Iran, and Algeria. Islam and Christianity are not just religions with a collection of teaching you have to know and a list of things that you do or not do. He says, I believe that both Islam and Christianity are more than that. I believe that both Islam and Christianity are more than that because in Christianity, he, he says, spirit of Islam and a spirit of Christianity uh, is, is has a difference mm -hmm. because uh, Islam believes God far away who is all the time waiting for you to make a mistake and punish you. That is, in, in, in the God of in Christianity is God that has love mm -hmm. all the time ready to embrace a sinner. Mm -hmm. And that's the big difference. Yeah, for God so loved the world that He gave He's, His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16, showing that love of God, that what, what manner of love is this, that God should give His only begotten Son? Yes, exactly. Sin. But you don't get that in Islam. No. But yet we always hear, and we hear that on the news and on these television talk shows, that Islam and Christianity have the same God. But you're saying that's not true. <clears throat> no, it's not the same God because God of Islam is not God the Father. Whereas God of Christianity is God the Father. God of Islam is not God a love name. 99 names God has, but in that 99 names, there's no name of God love. Whereas in Christianity, we believe God is love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe the concept of God we are hearing from 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 political point of view uh, from the media is not the right god of islam now when i think of god also you think of the the attributes or the moral qualities of the divine being god being loved in 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 christianity is also the god of holiness mm -hmm. you know holy 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 the lord god almighty you you have the god of righteousness mm -hmm. holiness justice uh, all these things are are told us in the old and new testaments about what god expects and how we should treat our fellow man with kindness love jesus taught you know uh, you know we should love our enemies uh, do right to those who despitefully use you things of this nature uh, and about vengeance and things he says no you should have let god be the avenger you don't go out and you know, take kill somebody or take yes. the law in your own hands. The, the, the Bible talks about how the government is there for uh, justice, and that would be uh, Romans 13. But anyway, uh, the moral qualities is what I'm getting at. The moral qualities of God of the Bible seems to be so different than the moral qualities of the God of Islam. As you were just mentioning, the persecution, and those that miss the first show, you ought to see the, uh, the persecution of non-Muslims under Islamic law, where you're allowed to do all these terrible things to people that are considered kafir, unbelievers, unbelievers in Islam. The God of Islam allows all kinds of terrible things to be done to people that, according to the God of the Bible, would be considered sin and wrong and abominations to that God who will send you to hell for doing the kind of things that the God of of Islam condones. Mm -hmm. So the very moral qualities of these two gods are completely different. Yes, it is. And so I, I always say, how can they be the same God when over here you got the Islamic God saying, kill him? Yes. <laughs> and over here the other one is saying, uh, forgive him. Forgive him and do right to him and, mm -hmm. and help him and in all these types of things like the, the teachings of Jesus show the Sermon on the Mount yes. and blesses are the meek yes. <laughs> you know you get these kinds of, it's so alien from Muhammad's teachings where he says take the sword crucify them cut off their hands and feet uh, the Hadith say how he burned their eyes out yes. you know and, and made them die of thirst and, yes. and slaughter put them to shame and, yeah, and put them to shame and slaughtered whole, whole, uh, yeah. all the men of cities and sold their wives mm -hmm. into slavery and even took uh, uh, sex captives yes. from, from some of the women he captured in battle along yes. with his followers. 
all that's so alien. And, it's, <laughs> and, and the, the most the biggest thing that we don't hear from the media, God of, of Islam and God of, of Christianity, we believe in God, triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Whereas in Islam, God the Spirit is Angel Gabriel. For them, there's no Holy Spirit. Right. The Holy Spirit, according to the Quran and the Hadith, yes. is the Angel Gabriel. Gabriel. Yes. So they deny the very nature of uh, what we find in the Bible as being the third person of the Holy Godhead, the Trinity. Yes. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But to the, the Muslims, the Holy Spirit is is this angel yes. named Gabriel who got in contact with Muhammad to come up with this, this Quran. Quran, exactly. So, so even, e even there, that shows the gods of these two respective religions have to be different. Yes. Because the Holy Spirit in Christianity is God. Yes. But in Islam, the Holy Spirit's only this angel. Yes. That's a servant of yes. Allah. And secondly, according to the Quran, Christ is created from the dust. Whereas in, in, in the Bible, in the Gospels, God is the Word. Jesus is the Word of God, a Son of God. Yeah, John Equally, 1, 1. In the John beginning was the Word, the yes. Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 goes on to say, And the Word became flesh and dwelt, uh, dwelt among us. Yes. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. So it cannot, cannot be the same God. It, it's a different God. That's why we're having this problem. Right. And... Once again, it gets back to that media situation. Islam is peace. Uh, Christians and Muslims have the same God. But as we've been just talking already, we're seeing that uh, from a doctrinal, theological perspective already, the, the, the gods have to be different. The God of Islam and the God of Christianity, different gods. And their moral attributes are different. Because Allah is telling them to do this thing over here, and uh, the Christian God's saying, "No, don't do that. Do this." Uh, and, uh, and then you have this, this this idea of Islam being peace, but as as I've mentioned many times on many of our shows on Islam, uh, it seems the only peace that you're going to get is if everybody's either dead or they become Muslims. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's three choices. <laughs> three choices out of three. So if you're not if if you're not a Muslim, then you're going to get no peace. <laughs> from the Muslims or the God of Islam. And we read plenty of references last time yes. out of the Quran to show that. So uh, uh, those are just a few, mm -hmm. just a few of the differences yes. between Islam and uh, Christianity. Yes. Now, is there uh, something else you'd like to point out here along these lines? Uh, <clears throat> regarding uh, God of, of, uh, of uh, Jesus, or our Christian God, and God of Muhammad. God of Muhammad is a judge. Whereas God of Christianity is God the Father, who is waiting for the prodigal son or a daughter to come, so that he's once again part of the family. He's not waiting to judge us, to throw it in a hell, but he's there waiting for us to come and join with him, to live with him forever mm -hmm. and have eternal life. And there's a big difference there. Now, let me ask you this. Now, why is it uh, that, you know, in Christianity, you have the, the, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus is always talking about the Father. Yes. And he gives a great high priestly prayer there in John 17, you know, uh, and talks to the Father continually throughout the Gospels. Mm -hmm. The Father, the Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed yes. be thy name. Yes. But in, in the Muslims, the Muslims regard Jesus as a great prophet. And yes. he brought the angel. Yes. And he, he had this mission to bring mm -hmm. people to God. Yeah. How come the Muslims never use that term father like Jesus did? How come it's always Allah, but I never hear the Muslims calling Allah father as Jesus did, and he's considered to be a great prophet of Islam, according to their view. Have you, have you ever, in your 33 years in Pakistan, mm -hmm. did you ever, and you went to Islamic school yes. over there, you mm -hmm. were forced to go to it, uh, did they ever talk about that? Why Allah is not called Father by Muslims, according to the teachings of Jesus? See, according to Surah 5, verse 73, it says, uh, they do blaspheme who say Allah is one of three in a trinity, 
for there is no God except one Allah. And that's the struggle they, they are going through when they hear God is love, God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's what they are having problem with, the true in God. Mm -hmm. In the Quran itself. The Quran says, no, there's only one God, and it is far away from it. It's in heavens, in seventh heaven or somewhere. Mm -hmm. And they don't like the idea of father because it ties in with the idea, well, if there's a father, there must be a son. Son. And that goes against what you just read. Exactly. Because according to what the Quranic teaches and the Hadith say mm -hmm. in Islam, if you believe in the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or you have partners with God, as Muhammad phrases it in the Quran, well, then you're a blasphemer. Yes. And you're going to be going to hell, basically. Yes. Exactly. And so right away, there's another incredible distinction. Yes. Now, now, why? Now that brings me to another thing, and I know you got something lined up here, but i got to yes. ask you this. I hear a lot of Muslims uh, call Christians our Christian brethren. But if the Quran says if you believe in this Trinity or you have partners with God, you're a blasphemer, you're a kafir, you're, you're cursed, and you're, you're going to be sent to hell, why do they call Christians brethren? <laughs> I mean, I, is that a ploy to try to just come across like, oh, we're good guys? And yeah, that's got, exactly what it is. Just to, it, to come across to let you know that you, know, you are my, my brother. But if you look at the, <clears throat> the, the theology of Ummah, which is uh, very strong in, in popular Islam, mm -hmm. uh, I would say in Urdu, because I heard all the time when I was growing up, say, uh, Muslim, Muslim, bhai, bhai, baki, sab, kafir. That means in English, we Muslims are all brothers, rest are all infidels. Mm -hmm. So that the theology is installed in their heads from the childhood in the madrasas, in Islamic small schools, next to the mosque or in the mosque when they teach, that only your brother is, is a Muslim brother. Rest, everybody is kafir, is, is infidel. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is a very, very strong uh, theological issue that they are uh, drilled in, in from the childhood. It's just implanted into their psyche from yes. childhood that, hey, we're all brothers as Muslims, but these other guys, if they're Christians, if they're Hindus, Hindus Buddhists, Buddhists, whatever, they're, they're, they're not our brothers. No, they're, 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 not. they're infidels. They're infidels. And they're worthy of death. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And so I, I think when we hear on a, in the Western media anyway that Islam is peace, we have the same God, mm -hmm. and uh, the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims, they're all brothers, mm -hmm. and they all worship the same God, and they all revere Jerusalem. Well, uh, that, you know, there's this, like, brotherhood there. But to me, that all just sounds like a PR campaign to hide the truth. Exactly. <laughs> because whatever reasons uh, the media has, uh, with all respect, uh, I think they are, time to time, they should come uh, out also with the real Islamic understanding of God, about jihad, about uh, about what they believe uh, out of salvation, out of ummah, and why they are behaving that way. Because that's that's the core. Because if you're not a Muslim, you are you are my enemy. Mm -hmm. According because to their... you're, according to their um, theology of ummah. That's right. You're yeah. not ummah. <laughs> and. Uh... I guess what we're doing here is we're, re one reason we're doing this program is just to show why uh, what you're being told main, by mainline media sources and what you see in reality when you read about another bomb going off and more terrorists have killed a bunch of people <laughs> and there seems to be a religious connection, but yet these are just extremists and, yes. and, and it's always a, a fundamentalist and an extremist and it's not really the religion of islam these are perverters of islam these aren't these these guys that go around blowing up school buses and killing kids uh even though they're yelling allah akbar, uh, allah akbar. They, they 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 they're extremists and they don't really they're they're making a mockery of islam that's what we're being told but i don't think that's the case at all no i don't believe it either Living in Pakistan, experiencing Islam so much for so many years, and living among them, and being persecuted not just by myself, but most of my Christian brothers and sisters and non-Muslims in Pakistan, I can say it with certainty that they are big numbers. 
I cannot say how much percentage they are, but they are not in small numbers. They are not just extremists. They are big numbers. And they're taking this Quran seriously. And they, they take it literally what is in Quran and Hadith and Sunnah and Sharia. Mm -hmm. And they believe it. That's what God wants from them as a Muslim young man and woman. Now, now uh, you've got a, a great quote, and I think at this point in our conversation, it would be great to bring it up from the Ayatollah Khomeini out of Iran. And if you could get that quote, and, uh, and while you're getting it, I'll, I'll mention the fact that in Islam, we have Sunnis and we have Shiites comprising the vast majority of your Muslims. But the Shiites are a little different than the Sunnis, and one reason for that is the fact that uh, the Shiites uh, believe in what's called a uh, 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 like a like an ayatollah, I guess you yes. know, a, imam, which is imam, yeah, and a successor to Muhammad, which is a little different than the Sunnis who kind of stop at Muhammad, but the Shiites. Look to the, and, and I want you to explain that a little bit to our Western viewers here who don't understand the power mm -hmm. that like an Ayatollah Khomeini would have. What is his authority in Shiite Islam? And once you explain that, give us some of the quotes that you have from him that will really put the, put the, the, the wood to the situation to explain the kind of danger we're in with this. this. Yes, I think Imam uh, Khomeini in, in, in Shia religion is, is, a, is a successor of, a uh, continuation of successor of Muhammad's, like the caliphs were, and then in, in the imams were, 12 imams, and this is the continuation of that cycle. And he has the absolute authority to interpret the Quran and the Sharia and the Islamic law and the Sunnah to the people, and people are supposed to believe and listen to him. Now it's Shiites. Yeah, Shiites. Yeah. Now, this is almost equivalent to like in Roman Catholicism of the, the infallibility of the, of pope, the pope, an infallible interpretation of the, uh, the uh, uh, I forgot the ex exact term of that, but they've got a uh, organization at, in the church that it infallibly in, in, interprets scripture. But uh, this is the same thing, infa yeah. infallibility of the Pope. Yeah, equally, equally powerful. And equally, or the magisterium, magisterium, right. equally, are. equally powerful and equally uh, infallible. Right. So right. he he Khomeini is talking about the jihad and how he understands jihad and how he interprets the the understanding of jihad and, from Quran. And you're not just saying this is his interpretation. This is it is his interpretation. Yes. But everyone's required to accept, accept what he says. says. Yes. That's the. That's key. the kicker. That's yeah, the key. That's the key. <laughs> right. Yes. So and what does he, he say? And he says, Islam makes it incumbent on all adult males, provided they are not disabled and incapacitated, to prepare themselves for the conquest of other countries, so that the writ of Islam is obeyed in every country in the world. But those who study Islamic holy war will understand why Islam wants to conquer the whole world. Those who know nothing of Islam pretend that Islam counsels against war. Those who say this are witless. Islam says, kill all the unbelievers just as they would like to kill you. Do this, does this mean that Muslims should sit back until they are devoured by the unbeliever. Islam says, kill them, which means the non-Muslims, put them to the sword and scatter their armies. Does this mean sitting back until non-Muslims overcome us? Islam says, kill in the service of Allah those who may want to kill you. Does this mean that we should surrender to the enemy? Islam says, Whatever good there is exists thanks to the sword in the shadow of the sword. People cannot be made obedient except with the sword. The sword is the key to paradise, which can be opened only for holy warriors. There are hundreds of other 
Quranic Psalms and Hadith saying of the Prophet, urging Muslims to value war and to fight. Does all that mean that Islam is a religion that prevents men from waging war? I spit upon those foolish souls who make such a claim. That's, that's right from the words, the lips of Ayatollah Khomeini, who speaks with the authority of an infallible pope to a willingly uh, obedient Shiite population that uh, I guess the majority would be in Iran. Iran. And how, yes. how, how many uh, people would live there? Maybe uh, millions of people. Yes, millions. 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 So he's saying, I, I thought it was interesting, he's, he's actually saying these people are witless that, that yes. don't think that the Quran and the Hadith teach war. War, yes. And he says, and he says kill he, them. Yes. And he says, I spit, on, I, spit, I spit on the soul if they believe that. That's right. That's right. And he says, you've got to use the sword and be a holy warrior through jihad to enter the gates of paradise. And not only to do that, but we have to conquer the world. That's right. Make them Islamic. That's right. And, and of course, that's taught in the Quran and the yes. Hadith anyway. Yes. So to me... Uh, just knowing, having, having read the Quran and these Hadiths myself anyway, uh, you know, I can understand why he says that. But now someone who's ignorant, that doesn't know this stuff, and they hear him say that, they think he's some kind of radical fundamentalist that is just making this stuff up and, and he's distorting Islam, they couldn't be more wrong. They couldn't be more wrong. <laughs> How can he be, be a fundamentalist? who's leading millions and millions of Shiites in Iran and other parts of the world, who listen to him as, as, a, as their Khomeini, as their... As, their, their as a successor, successor to Muhammad. Yes, almost successor to Muhammad. Right. And, right. and direct linkage with the Imams, mm -hmm. which is the a continuation of, of, the, of, the, of the, you know, relationship with Muhammad. Right, right. So I cannot understand how Islam can be peace. <laughs> Unless it is, like we said before, the only peace really is for those who convert to Islam, and they'll get some peace within the Islamic Brotherhood, but anyone else, you either die and get your peace that way, or, yes. or, or, or you uh, get no peace at all because yes. you'll be persecuted. Now, now, Khomeini mentions there in that quote, uh, in fact, you might want to mention where that quote came from for those viewers that want the difference between Jesus and Muhammad, for instance, is vast mm -hmm. when you look at their lives individually mm -hmm. uh, and then comparatively. But uh, what, is the, what does Islam say about paradise compared to uh, the uh, uh, Christian paradise? Uh, or well, let's talk about a little bit about is uh, hell. What yeah, Islam hell thinks paradise. of hell? Yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead and look at <clears throat> let's look at both of those things. Yes. Because the the kafir, the unbeliever, is going to hell, and mm -hmm. they're blasphemers because they believe in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, they they believe in partners with God and all these things. So they're going to hell, and then uh, the Muslims think by the sword and stuff they're under the gate for paradise. So let's take a look at uh, the Islamic hell, and uh, also the Islamic paradise. Okay. Now. Description of hell in, in, in Islam is it, from the Dr. Salim Al Mahdi's uh, uh, article, uh, March 1998. Uh, he says, Hell in Islam is a place of fire and torment. Allah prepared to fill it with the jinnis, jinnis, evil spirits, and mankind, and no one will escape. It's very interesting to know. That no one, no one escapes that uh, that uh, hell. Everybody has to pass through through hell after the death. It has been created for both the righteous and the unrighteous. In the Quran, in Surah Al Hiraj, Surah 15, verse 43 and 44, it says, "Gehenna, hell, shall be their promised land." And together seven gates it has, and unto each gate a set portion of them belongs. Read also in Surah Maryam, uh, verse 71, Not one of you there is, but he shall go down to it, which is hell, that for the Lord is a thing decreed, determined. 
then we shall deliver those that were God fearing. So God decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. But everybody has to go to hell, including Muhammad. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's even in the Hadith, I believe, in one of our previous shows, I think we gave a reference to that. Okay. That my memory conserves me. Okay. So that's totally different, though, from the, the, the biblical concept because uh, there, only, only the wicked and the unrighteous and the unbelievers yes. uh, go to hell. Mm -hmm. And uh, the righteous and those that are born again and, and, and washed in the blood of Christ, yes. they never see hell. They go to heaven and yes. they avoid hell. Yes. But in Islam, everybody goes to hell. Yeah, but the interesting part is that if you die as a martyr, you don't have to go to that process. You go straight to heaven. Ah, that's right. I forgot about that. So you there's, a, there's avoid, an exception clause. There's an exception clause. And that's why these young men or women would like to die as a martyr because they, they escaped that process of hell. Right. So yeah, when they're following one of the terrorist organizations and they get killed... Uh, blowing themselves up in an airplane or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. they think, all right, I died as a martyr in the cause of a holy war, yes. a, a jihad for Allah, so mm -hmm. I can cause go straight to paradise. paradise. And, and there's a very big de description in, 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 in Islam and how paradise will be. Well, let's hear about it. Go ahead and uh, tell our viewers what the Islamic paradise is that all these suicide bombers and things are trying to get to. Uh, well, <clears throat> it says uh, one very strange thing that paradise has is the Huris. Uh, Huris is a most beautiful young woman uh, and uh, very sexually desirable. sexually desirable, who are assigned to fulfill man's sexual pleasure. These Huris are always virgins and their relations with men do not affect their virginity. They are white with charming wide black eyes and smooth skins. Women who die old on earth will be recreated virgins for the enjoyment of men. And that's how people, young men want to die. So they, they want to die so they can get to this Islamic paradise where they're going to get all these women these beautiful, sexually desirable <coughs> women who are continual virgins, and even after they have relations with them, they'll remain virgins, yes. and they will just be engaging in sex with them for all eternity, along with other um, passages I know, and I've got them all listed here, but I won't go into them all now. You know, the Quran that says there's going to be rivers, there's going to be gardens, yes. reclining chairs, there's going to be wine. Yes. You can, I, I know it's a sin uh, in Islam to drink wine now in this life, but in the Islamic in paradise, paradise you can drink wine. Yes. So to me that's kind of interesting. It's it's bad here, but it's good there, yes. uh, which to me seems kind of uh, uh, of a contradiction. But, uh, did you have something you wanted to add? Yes, to I just wanted to say that the strange part is the woman is here slave, and when she goes up, she's again going to be a slave of man. Right. Because man will enjoy that sexual intercourse with that same woman who dies here, she becomes a virgin there. And, and she is just one of his harem, basically. Yes, harem, yes. And I'm wondering what a wife would think. <laughs> if you're a Muslim wife and you got one husband, and you go, you both go to this Islamic paradise, and you're there with your husband, but now he's got like 70 or however many. 72. Yeah, because I've, I've read some reports where some uh, Islamic scholars say 70, and others say 72. Yeah, some say 101. Right, so right. Different traditions. A, right. And anyway, it seems to me uh, she might get a little jealous about that. I mean, you know, here, here her husband, and, and he's got all these other women, and he's got a, it sounds like he's going to have to put out a, a day planner or something when he can fit her in and schedule. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, that doesn't sound like too much of a good paradise for the woman. Anyway. Yes, I, I remember when I was growing <laughs> up in school, and they used to talk about this theology of paradise, and they would always talk about uh, you know the men will get hoodies and will have great jo joy mm -hmm. in heaven. And I used to ask them, what will a woman get in 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 a in a, in a paradise? And they used to get so upset with me and 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 beat me up. <laughs> Why I'm talking about that? That's right. See, they don't want to know. They don't know that. They don't want to know the, the truth of the situation. Yes. But so that was very funny for me. A man gets everything and a woman does not get anything. Right. Uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, while you were living in Pakistan, did you get a chance to uh, 
ask a Muslim woman about that? Or? Oh, I could. I couldn't dare to ask. Oh, oh, <laughs> they'll beat me, beat me up to death. Oh, the women, the women could beat you up worse than the men. Huh? Oh yes. Holy well, I, I can't have a friendship with a Muslim girl back home. A Muslim boy can enjoy with a Christian and or non-Muslim woman, mm -hmm. or or can marry, but Muslim girl or a woman cannot have relationship with a man. So the woman cannot, uh, the Muslim woman cannot have a relationship with a non-Muslim man. Yes. But the Muslim man can have a relationship with the non-Muslim women. Yes. So once again, the man has the advantage. Advantage. And I know in, uh, in the, 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 the Islamic law uh, that even in a court of law, it takes uh, the testimony of two women. Equal to one. Just to make up the, for the testimony of one man. One man. And of course, we also know in the Quran that uh, it says that you can have up to four wives. Yes. Uh, but the women don't get to have four husbands. No. And no. I also know uh, from our studies, and we put this on some of our other shows, uh, that in Islamic teaching, in the Hadith, uh, Muhammad said the majority of the dwellers of hell are women. Are women. Yes. He didn't say the majority of uh, women are going to hell, but he did say the majority of those that are, are in hell are women. So we have a real problem here. And I did want to mention one thing in contrast to this, uh, mm -hmm. the Lord Jesus Christ yes. found in the gospel, particularly Matthew chapter 22. Mm -hmm. I just happened to pull a reference here. And Jesus said in verse 29 and following, he says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was written unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and, of the, and, and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? God is not the... God of the dead, but of the living. And when they heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But in <clears> Jesus <throat> is saying there's no marrying or giving yes. of marriage yes. in heaven. Yes. In the next life. Just the opposite. Exactly. Just the opposite of what you get. <laughs> yes. And then we also know in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, it says, In Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile, yes. male nor female. female. We're all one, free or bond. We're all one in Christ. Christ. There's equality in Christianity, but you don't get that sure. with Islam mm -hmm. at all. And you have this almost uh, women being put down, uh, just like with the, the non-Muslim minorities, as a second-class second citizen, citizen under uh, Islam. And I want to quote something from Quran, Surah 4, verse 34, uh, what Muhammad has revealed, I mean, God has revealed to Muhammad, and what Muhammad interprets and gives. He says, as to those women on whose part ye feared disloyalty and ill conduct. Very important to remember. As to those women on whose part ye feared disloyalty and ill conduct, admonish them, refuse to share their beds, and beat them. That's right. And somewhere in some, in some last they say, scourge them. Well, you can, you're totally right. And, and, and in this Islam and in the Quran, you can beat your wife. I, I got in a debate a few months ago with a Muslim who called us up on our live television show, and he argued that point. He says, well, that beat there doesn't mean, like, really hit hard. It means sort of like a light tap or something like that. And I said, well, wait a minute. How do you know that? You know, I said, well, you don't know the Arabic, and the Arabic's all this. And I said, well, I may not know the Arabic, but I can interpret that based on what Muhammad said from the Hadith. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, uh, you know, because he didn't know. I happen to have the uh, the... Hadith reference. I don't have it at a, on hand with me here, but it's in some of our shows, and we did it on that. I had it with me that night of the show. But in the Hadith, mm -hmm. in the Al Bukhari, oh, Al -Bukhari. It, it says <coughs> in reference to one of his one of Muhammad's uh, uh, companions was asking him how he should beat, mm -hmm. you know, his wife. Yes. And Muhammad told him, "Well, beat your wife as you would beat a stallion camel." Yes. yes. And boy, you should have heard that guy. Quiet down fast. <laughs> See, because it all of a sudden it didn't matter yes. about the Arabic language yes. Yes. and what beat meant. Because yes. if Muhammad's going to tell you how to beat your wife, and in that culture in the, in the 7th century, yes. when, you're, when you're talking about a stallion camel, yes. 
I mean, to get that Campbell to move, you're going to have to do a little bit more than just... Yes. <laughs> you, can, you cannot uh, discipline a camel by just <laughs> touching, touching and telling that camel, turn this way and turn that way. Right. You, you hit. That's and right. I, I can say it because I have seen how they train camel donkeys and horses in my country. Right. They beat them with stick so hard that animal has no other way than to listen to the right. <laughs> it's, just, uh, it's very persuasive it's very persuasive and so uh, since you had personal experience of seeing the the donkeys and the cow and the animals like that there in pakistan you can understand even better than a westerner would that doesn't yes. see many camels or something mm -hmm. when muhammad says beat your wife like you would a stallion camel mm -hmm. It really means something to it you. Means, you've seen, yes, you've seen I, the way people have done it. Done it. I, I saw it all the time while growing up. Uh -huh. So I, I understand what it means. It, it doesn't have to be what it means in Arabic and what it means in... And it means beat up. Right, right. Hit. And see, once again, that's alien from our what we find in the Scripture, in, in, in the Christian Bible, where it says in like Ephesians 5, particularly verse 25, it says, Husbands... Love your wives as Christ loved the church, the church exactly. and gave his life for it. So, you you know, that's that's big time love. Yes. And if you really love your wife, you're not going to be slapping her around or hitting her with a stick and everything else trying to get her to do what you want. Because when, when there's that mutual love between a man and a woman, there's cooperation there. Surah 2 and verse 223, it says, Your wives are as a tilth a field to be plowed unto you. So approach your tilth when or how you will. Now this is the status of a woman or a wife in Islamic understanding. <laughs> is, is a field that you plow. It's, it's not equality. It's a thing. <laughs> That's right. It's just like a, a, a wife is like a field. Yes. A field and you just get out there and you just yes. take... take care of the business <laughs> and then go. Oh. And, and then again it says... Uh, regarding the divorce, now the divorce in Islam, woman cannot divorce, man can divorce. Okay, so once again, that's unfair to the women. Woman again, unfair to the woman. Well, maybe that's because Mama, Muhammad did say most of the dwellers of hell were women, and a lot of that was because, and it says in the Hadith, a lot of that was because the women are in hell because they were unfaithful to their husbands. Yes. And see, and all that ties back to this kind of inequality and control, that you're talking about. and how right. to control a woman, right? All the right. time, right? That's that's all it is, and uh, it's so it's so different yes. than what we find in the in the in the in the gospel records, the Christian New Testament, even in the Old Testament for that instance. When you read the laws of Moses in Leviticus, and they 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 show good equality for for women there. Enter those Levitical laws, even in the Old Testament, showing uh, that women have some rights, and yet uh, the Muslims claim that Moses is a great prophet yes. and one of the great prophets of Islam. And although there's 124,000 prophets, uh, there's Moses is one of the five purest of the pure, and you've still got his writings. They say you've still got the Injil from Jesus. You still got the Psalms of David, mm -hmm. David being another great prophet under Islamic teaching. Yes, yes. And I'm wondering why, when you read the sayings of Jesus or Moses or David, yes. you don't get this kind of inequality to women, yet they give lip service, yes. lip service to these prophets, as they call them. Yes, go ahead. It's, it's just not, uh, it, it's, in my mind, it's another contradiction in the Islamic teaching. They, get, they say, Moses, you know, you can, you can believe Moses, you can believe David, you can believe Jesus, and Muhammad's the, the greatest and the last prophet. Yet what Muhammad is saying doesn't match up. It doesn't line up with what we see from these other so-called prophets that Muhammad refers to. Hmm. In other words, Muhammad is overruling, changing the rules. He's not going along with what these other prophets said on women, on paradise, on hell, on the nature of God or any of these things. It's all different. Yet at the same time, he gives lip service to all these people, even Abraham. Even, even talking about how Abraham was going to sacrifice Ishmael instead of Isaac. Yes. And once again, that's a contradiction of Moses. Moses. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, brother, you got something else? Yes, I'm going to read about uh, what uh, 
Abu Bakr thought of of a of a uh, woman, according to Abu Bakr, woman was a toy. Uh, the, the, this from Council uh, uh, Ulama, Volume Twenty One, Hadith Number Nine Hundred and Nineteen. Uh, Abu Bakr says in his book, uh, Abu Bakr Ahmad Ibn Abd Allah, one of the Muslim scholars, said, Umar, the just caliph was once talking when his wife inject, interjected. So he said to her, you are a toy. If you are needed, we will call you. Amr bin Al-Anas, also a caliph said, women are toys, so choose. So you choose a toy, you choose a woman. Right. I mean, this is the status of a woman in, in the eyes of Caliph Umar That's right. and Muhammad and 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 other successes. And, and you know, when you think about it, when we were kids, we had our toys, and uh, my parents get mad at me if I left my toys outside of my room and I left them laying out in the yard or something. Get mm -hmm. your toys and keep them in your room. Well, I, that kind of reminds me of how Muhammad said that uh, uh, wives are supposed to stay in the house. Yes. <laughs> yes. Keep your toys in the house. <laughs> toys in the house. Yes. So it all... Cover it up. Yeah, right. Hide it. Nobody will take it. Right. It all, it all makes sense from that perspective. Yes. So what we're, what we're seeing here is a religion that claims and gives lip service to Jesus, gives lip service to David, to Moses, to Adam, mm -hmm. to Noah, and, 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 and tells some kind of... Bible stories and, and Old Testament stories and some other stories, and it claims some kind of link to Old Testament, New Testament. But as we analyze it and look at it for what it's teaching in comparison to what these other prophets are teaching, and we're teaching long before Muhammad came along. Yes. Moses in the Old Testament were there, and the manuscript evidence was there long before Muhammad came along. And, you know, in the seventh century, 600 years after Christ. Mm -hmm. And you got the, the manuscript records of the New Testament, of the saints of Jesus, uh, going all the way back hundreds of years before Muhammad. And then you got, you could recreate everything from the writings of the early church fathers and from early Ch Jewish sources like the Septuagint, 200 mm -hmm. years before Christ. Yes. And all of that contradicts, disagrees with the teachings of Muhammad, who's claiming that. He's simply restoring what these guys said. And from my perspective, and I'm sure you would agree, I don't think he's really telling the truth on this based on the historical evidences and facts that we have before us. Just to illustrate the tremendous contrast between Islamic teachings and teachings of the Bible, we can see by this screen what the Quran and the Islamic Hadith have to say about whether women can be beaten by their husbands. Exactly how do they beat their wives? Surah 434 says a husband can beat his disobedient wife. The word beat is also used of beating a camel or violent criminal. Quote, how does any one of you beat his wife as he beats the stallion camel and then he may embrace sleep with her? And Hisham said, as he beats his slave, end quote. And that's from the Al-Bakari Hadith, volume 8, number 68, page 42. Along these lines of wife beating in Islamic teachings, we find the prophet of Islam, Muhammad himself, beat his wife, causing her pain. Quote, Aisha said, that's Muhammad's wife, quote, he, Muhammad, struck me on the chest, which caused me pain, end quote. It's from the Sahith Muslim Hadith, volume 2, 2127, page 462. The context is when Muhammad thought Aisha was asleep, he snuck out, and Aisha followed him. When Muhammad returned, Aisha was breathing heavily, and Muhammad caught her. This shows that in Islam, even the prophet himself beat his wife, and encouraged his followers to do the same. In stark contrast, the biblical text in Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, 
Verse 28 says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Uh, quite a contrast from wife beating in Islam. We know from what we, we've seen in the, in, in the Christian teachings and things that uh, we're all one in Christ. God doesn't uh, show favoritism uh, of one sex over uh, one sex over another sex. He he uh, he's uh, magnanimous in his love for us. And uh, and when we look at what the way Muhammad talks about women as toys, or most of them, the majority of them are uh, dwellers of hell are women, and, and they're they they only get. Uh, it takes two women to make up uh, one man's uh, witness, a te witness or testimony mm -hmm. in a court of law. They got to stay in the house, and there's all kinds of other things you could say. This just doesn't, you know, brother, sound like we're talking about the same God as we're always hearing in the news media and representatives of Islam. Well, we all believe the same God. We all have the same God, and Islam's religion of peace, and and all these types of things. It just, it just doesn't sound true for anyone who actually studies it. No. Now this is we we've only got a we got less than a couple of minutes to okay. go here, mm -hmm. and uh, I would like you uh, to spend this time if you could talking to maybe some Muslims that are watching right now. They've heard some of the things we've said. Mm -hmm. What would you tell these Muslims mm -hmm. as we get ready to go off the air yes. that might uh, give them some hope for the future if they are accepting some of the things we might have been saying here? There's no salvation unless. We follow Christ. He's the only way, the truth, and life. And nobody enters except to the Son, Jesus. And I suggest and invite you to listen and reflect carefully what we have talked about with Brother Larry here and you have heard and make a choice. Make a right choice. You have the right to choose. And you know the truth and the untruth. Christ is only way. Come to Him because God the Father loves you through Jesus Christ our Lord. I pray that one day the love of Christ will reach you. I hope through this videotape it will touch your heart, mind and soul and help you to reflect that you are loved by God. Come to Him who is Father and only love who cares. Praise God. Thank you, brother. Well, I'm uh, Larry Wessels for Christian Answers uh, with my very special guest. It's been a joy to have you here with us, Thank brother. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> with uh, Salim Masi uh, from Pakistan, now here in America. Praise God that you're here with us to uh, share the love of Christ. But uh, contact our ministry if you need any information, our phone number, mailing address, website, email, all at the end of the show. We, we have newsletters. We have a, a variety of free material we can offer you. Uh, just give us a holler. Thank you so much. Uh, may the love of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion 
created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available.